You've probably seen the signs on the backs of tanker trucks and rail cars, on pressure vessels and even secondary bottle containers. Hazardous communication or HAZCOM is how the hazards of a chemical are communicated to people. Being an employee owner means that you are included in the HAZCOM program. You have the right to know the hazards of the chemicals that you are working with. In addition to labels on containers, safety data sheets or SDS contain all of the information about chemicals including the signs and symptoms of exposure, first aid and CPR measures, as well as firefighting methods and required PPE. You can obtain copies of the chemical SDS as well as our written HAZCOM program by asking your supervisor. The Globally Harmonized System or GHS is an international approach to hazard communication, providing the agreed criteria for classification of chemical hazards and a standardized approach to label elements and safety data sheets. It was developed by the United Nations and the GHS is updated every two years. OSHA has modified the hazard communication standard to adopt the GHS to improve safety and the health of workers through more effective communications on chemical hazards. This new system will standardize chemical labels and chemical classification worldwide. Employers must train their employees in understanding the change from Material Safety Data Sheets or MSDS to Safety Data Sheets or SDS. Employers must train their employees on the new label elements as well as the new SDS sheet format. And finally, chemical manufacturers have to update their labels and safety data sheets. Chemical manufacturers must now evaluate and classify chemicals according to the GHS. GHS classification system recognizes two categories of chemical hazards, health hazards and physical hazards. Chemicals which are classified as health hazards can cause health problems ranging from mild allergic reactions to death. Physical hazards threaten worker safety and create or contribute to unsafe conditions, for example, fires, explosions, and chemical reactions. Appendix C of the standard explains how chemicals must be labeled in a standardized format. Chemical labels must include the following information. Product name, pictogram, signal word, hazard statement, precautionary statement, and contact information. The MSDS will now be referred to as the SDS, or Safety Data Sheet, and now are required to follow a standardized format. SDS sheets will contain 16 numbered sections in numerical order. Some of the information included on the safety data sheets is identification of the chemical, hazard identification, stability and reactivity of the chemical, ecological information, disposal considerations, first aid, and firefighting measures. On chemical containers, pictograms are used internationally to clearly identify the health and physical hazards of the product. Five pictograms are used for physical hazards, four pictograms are used for health hazards, and one pictogram is used for environmental hazards. Pictograms for physical hazards include explosives, flammable liquids, oxidizing liquids, compressed gases, and corrosive metals. Pictograms for health hazards include acute toxicity, skin corrosion, skin irritation, and CMR STOT aspiration hazard. And finally, the pictogram for environmental hazards is 
hazardous to aquatic environment. In compliance with the Occupational Safety and Health Act, all employee owners have right of access to records of relevant exposure to toxic substances or harmful physical agents and medical records. To access these records, employee owners must contact their supervisor or Alston's Human Resource Department. A copy of OSHA 1910.1020 or 1926.33 is readily available to all employee owners by contacting the Human Resources Department of Alston Industrial. Hearing Conservation Program Hearing Loss We take our hearing for granted. We don't think about being able to hear the next sound. But hearing is an important part of the quality of our life. Continued exposure to noise above 85 decibels can result in permanent hearing loss. Anatomy of the ear There's the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The outer ear consists of the auricle or pinna, which collects sound. The middle ear has the tympanic membrane or eardrum and conducts sound by vibrating. Ossicles or tiny bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes, is like a lever system to conduct sound. The eustachian tube equalizes air pressure in the middle ear. The inner ear is fluid filled. The cochlea is snail shaped and contains hair cells. How we hear sounds. Sound waves enter the ear canal. The eardrum vibrations pass along tiny bones. Tiny hair-like cells flow back and forth. The auditory nerve sends signals that are registered as sound to the brain. Types of hearing loss. There's conductive hearing loss and sensory neural hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss consists of canal blockage, ruptures, or infections. Sensory neural hearing loss is more like presbycusis, which is age-related. Head injuries, ototoxic medication can cause it, various diseases, and noise-related hearing loss. Noise-related hearing loss is a documented pattern of damage to the inner ear when a person is exposed to excessive noise over an extended period of time. How hearing is damaged. The most common way of losing hearing is through gradual damage to the delicate hair-like cells. Normal sounds cause the cells to move back and forth like grass in a gentle breeze. Loud noise causes the hair to lie flat. Once the noise stops, the hairs spring back, much the way a trampled field of grass will slowly spring back. But eventually, over a long period of time of loud noise exposure, the tiny hair-like cells no longer spring back and one day they're too damaged to even return to their normal position at all. And once hearing is damaged, it cannot be repaired or replaced. Some signs of hearing loss. Difficulty hearing people speak, inability to hear certain high-pitched or soft sounds, noise or ringing in the ears, getting complaints that the radio or TV volume is too high. Types of noise. There's pitch or frequency and loudness. Pitch or frequency is measured in hertz. Loudness is measured in decibels with a sound level meter. Pitch or frequency can refer to the high pitch being more like a children's voice or violins playing. The low pitch is more like a bass drum or baritone voice. Below are some examples of loudness in everyday sounds. A whisper is like 10 decibels. Sander, 85 decibels. A sporting event, 100 decibels motorcycle riding 112, concerts 125, and the shooting range 130 decibels. How does hearing loss impact the worker? 
and can interfere with communication, cause fatigue, causes distractions, or can be irritating if you have ringing in your ears. It reduces morale or efficiency, and all of these factors can cause workplace accidents. Noise monitoring. The first step of a hearing conservation program is to conduct a noise level monitoring survey to determine what types of noise employees are exposed to. Employees or their representatives are provided the opportunity to observe any noise monitoring that is conducted. A typical noise monitoring strategy will determine if noise hazards exist, identify employees who are impacted, and help prioritize noise control efforts. Affected employees. All employees exposed to 85 decibels or more for an 8-hour time-weighted average are considered affected employees and must participate in this training program. Inclusion in the Hearing Conservation Program means that you are impacted by the requirements of this program. Hearing tests. Hearing or audiometric tests are offered to all employees who are included in the Hearing Conservation Program. The hearing tests are conducted by a qualified medical provider who will also evaluate the hearing test results. The first test is the baseline test and that must be conducted within an employee's first six months of inclusion in the Hearing Conservation Program. Follow-up tests are conducted annually. Standard Threshold Shift Hearing tests are evaluated to determine if any hearing loss has occurred. Standard Threshold Shift, or an STS, is a change in hearing relative to the baseline test of an average of 10 decibels or more at 2,000 Hz, 3,000 Hz, and 4,000 Hz in either ear. When you have an STS, you must be notified within 21 days. Sometimes revised hearing protection is required, and also sometimes further medi medical evaluation is required. Noise reduction efforts. There are different kinds of noise reduction efforts. Engineering controls, which is reducing noise at the source, interruption of the noise path, reducing reverberation, and structural vibration or administrative controls, operating noisy equipment on second or third shifts, and rotating employees through high noise areas. Hearing protection devices. These consist of earplugs, canal caps, and earmuffs. There are many different styles and brands of earplugs, but they're all very similar. Canal caps are useful for employees who are exposed to loud noise for short periods of time, or someone who has to walk through a high noise area to get from one department to another. Earmuffs are gen generally used as a supplemental protection from noise. Headphones on portable radios do not count as a hearing protection device. The purpose of hearing protection is to reduce your exposure to noise. The exposure must be reduced by the hearing protection device you wear to at least an 8-hour time-weighted average of 90 decibels. If you have suffered hearing loss and are classified as having experienced a standard threshold shift, you must have hearing protection that reduces exposure to at least an 8-hour time-weighted average of 85 decibels. Each hearing protection device is rated to reduce noise exposure by a certain number of decibels. This is called a noise reduction ratio, or NRR. However, the NRR is a laboratory result. The real-world NRR is significantly less because of inadequate fit and application from most employees. For earplugs, assume the real-world NRR is less than one-third of the NRR listed on the package. Typically, we take the listed on the package NRR minus 7 and divide in half, and that's your estimated attenuation. Hearing protection use. Voluntary use is that for people exposed to an 8-hour time-weighted average of 85 decibels, they can choose to wear hearing protection. Mandatory use is if you're exposed to an 8-hour time-weighted average of 90 decibels or more. Training. Training is required annually and topics must include how noise impacts hearing, hearing protection devices, and hearing tests. Record keeping. Management is required to keep records of noise monitoring results, hearing test results, job assignments and noise exposure history, hearing protection devices used, and all of these records must be accessible. 
Employee responsibility. Understanding the need for hearing protection. Wear your hearing protection and seek replacements. Encourage coworkers to wear hearing protection devices and communicate all problems to your supervisor. Here are some hearing conservation resources. The Council for Accreditation in Hearing Conservation, the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety, NASA, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, the National Hearing Conservation Association. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this video. Please wear your hearing protection and protect your hearing. Thank you. This video provides a brief overview and general information on respiratory hazards in general industry and respiratory protection program requirements. OSHA uses the term general industry to refer to all industries not included in agriculture, construction, or maritime. The Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration, also called OSHA, and state OSHA agencies require employers to have respiratory protection programs if their workers are required to wear respirators on the job. This video does not cover all of the things that your employer must do under federal OSHA or state OSHA respiratory protection standards. This video can be part of the OSHA required respiratory protection training which includes many topics like how to put on and take off a respirator and how to use, clean, and maintain your respirator. Your employer must also provide you with worksite specific training. While this video discusses some of your employer's responsibilities under OSHA's respiratory protection standard, it is important to remember that the purpose of a respirator is to protect your health and safety. Respiratory hazards can exist in various forms at general industry worksites. They may be gases, vapors, dusts, mists, fumes, smoke, sprays, and fog. Some of these substances can make you sick or kill you if you breathe them in. Certain respiratory hazards act quickly, like carbon monoxide, an invisible odorless gas which can make you unconscious or kill you in minutes. Other respiratory hazards can take years to make you sick, like asbestos, which can cause lung cancer years or even decades after you breathe it in. More examples of respiratory hazards in general industry include, but are not limited to, dusts, such as those found when adding dry ingredients to a mixture, metal fumes from welding, cutting, and smelting of metals, solvent vapors from spray coatings, adhesives, paints, strippers, and cleaning solvents, infectious agents, such as tuberculosis bacteria in healthcare settings, chemical hazards such as chlorine gas and anhydrous ammonia in chemical processing and use operations, sensitizing vapors or dusts such as isocyanates, certain epoxies, and beryllium, oxygen deficiency which might be found in confined spaces, and pharmaceuticals during the production of prescription drugs. When there are respiratory hazards in your workplace, your employer must use several methods to reduce your exposure to them, including engineering controls, such as local exhaust ventilation, work practice controls, such as applying coatings using a brush rather than a spray, and administrative controls, such as minimizing the exposure time or the number of workers exposed to the hazard. When you and your coworkers cannot be adequately protected from respiratory hazards through use of these methods, then your employer must provide you with an appropriate respirator to protect your health. Respiratory protection must be selected based on the hazard you will be exposed to on the job. Not every respirator will protect you against every hazard, so it's important for your employer to select the right one. For example, filtering face piece respirators may protect you against particulate hazards such as dusts, However, a filtering face piece respirator will not protect you against gas and vapor hazards such as solvent vapors.
If you are exposed to airborne hazards that are not particulates, you will need a different type of respirator. For example, you could use an air purifying respirator with chemical cartridges or an atmosphere supplying respirator, such as an airline respirator, or a self-contained breathing apparatus, also known as an SCBA. In addition, atmosphere supplying respirators are the only respirators that will protect you against hazardous atmospheres, like carbon monoxide and lack of oxygen. Remember, selecting an appropriate respirator is your employer's responsibility. When respirators must be used in your workplace, your employer must have a respiratory protection program. This program must meet the requirements of either the federal OSHA or your state OSHA respiratory protection standard. The standard requires your employer to do the following. Develop and implement a written respiratory protection program. Evaluate the respiratory hazards in the workplace. Select and provide appropriate respirators. Provide worker medical evaluations and respirator fit testing. Provide for the maintenance, storage, and cleaning of respirators. Provide worker training about respiratory hazards and proper respirator use. Evaluate workers' use of respirators and correct any problems. Provide you with access to specific records and documents, such as a written copy of your employer's respiratory protection program, and conduct a periodic program review. Because each workplace is different, it is very important that your employer's respiratory protection program address your specific workplace. For example, workplaces may differ in the following ways. The types and amount of respiratory hazards present. The people who manage the program. The policies and procedures for tasks such as respirator selection, maintenance, and use. And other exposure control methods such as using local exhaust ventilation. Workplace conditions that affect respiratory hazards and respirator use may change over time. Therefore, the written program must be updated as necessary to account for those changes in workplace conditions that affect respiratory hazards and respirator use. For example, changes in workplace conditions related to respiratory hazards could include new work processes or techniques, such as installing a new electroplating line, the use of new or different materials or chemicals, changes in the amount of a respiratory hazard in the workplace, or changes in the types of respirators being used. Notify your supervisor if something changes in your workplace that conflicts with or may not be covered by your respirator training or established workplace policies or procedures. Your employer's respiratory protection program must be managed by a qualified, trained program administrator. This person must monitor the program and make sure that you and your coworkers are adequately protected. The program administrator will know a lot about your workplace respiratory protection program and should be able to answer any questions you may have about respirator use. The program administrator must know about the requirements of the federal OSHA or state OSHA respiratory protection standard and evaluate the program periodically and make any necessary changes. This video has provided you with a brief overview of respiratory hazards in general industry and respiratory protection program requirements. There are many other things that you must know and do before you can safely use a respirator in a hazardous work environment. While this video may be part of your respiratory protection training, your employer must also provide you with additional training on respirators, including worksite specific training. Remember, if you don't know if a respirator is needed for the task you will be doing, or if you are unsure about how to properly use a respirator or which filter or cartridge to use, talk to your supervisor before entering the hazardous area. For more information about respirator use in your workplace, refer to these OSHA and NIOSH websites. You will find OSHA's respiratory protection standard, additional respirator training videos, and other guidance material to help you work safely.
The JSA, short for Job Safety Analysis, is a critical tool to your overall safety program. The JSA, or sometimes known as JHA, or Job Hazard Analysis, is a tool that links the appropriate safety measures to each piece of equipment and operation an employee might be expected to work on. They play a crucial role in your safety program because of the detailed step-by-step -step instructions they provide on how to properly operate the equipment or conduct the operation, as well as piece together the associated hazards of each step in the safe work procedures on how to protect yourself from these hazards. Once these tools are created, it's important that specific JSAs are trained on and that training is documented. These are just one of the pieces needed to ensure your training program is both setting your employees up to succeed in their various work functions, but also maintaining a solid compliance history full of detailed and documented training. For Summit Safety Group, I'm Jake Wolfenden, and even if I don't know you, I care about you and your safety. Have an awesome week.